Thank you very much. I'm very, very pleased to be here with you today. And certainly, eyesight, the performance of that, is something that affects us profoundly. And we have a, a, a tremendous opportunity to improve the quality of life for each and every one of us. And how we do that is through a, what we call the bionic lens, and that's a, a rather tall order just in the context of the name itself. But the bionic lens is a dynamic lens that replaces the natural lens inside the eye. And you may think, well, gee, that's quite invasive surgery, isn't it? Well, actually, it's the generalist of surgeries ever imaginable, even gentler than laser surgery. And the, the bionic lens has the ability to um, establish literally perfect performance throughout an entire person's life. So you don't have to worry about going through stages of, well, gosh, this was good now, but it's no good anymore, and now I can't focus up close. Uh, all of those things will be rectified because we get right to the essence of the, of the fallibility of the structures inside the eye. Just a, for your reference, say, uh, animation showing the natural lens changing curvature in response to the muscles. Because usually people say, what muscles in the eye? Well, uh, they're kind of like the iris behind uh, there pulling away on the lens to cause it to change curvature. Does so efficiently and effectively when we're young. We think that there's something wrong with autofocus cameras and why can't they just shift focus immediately like I do? Uh, well, what uh, the bionic lens does is it, it springs off that same concept of using curvature change to alter focus. And the bionic lens is tunable so that we can improve the sight well beyond what we can achieve with glasses. And I'll show you how we do that just in a short moment. And with that ability to improve the resolution, and that's the sharpness, the high definition, if you will, of our visual experience, we can reestablish the eye's ability to shift focus up very, very closely. And when you put high resolution with great range of focus, you'll be able to do things like look at a tiny sliver on your finger and actually start to see the cellular detail in your own finger. So it's, it's kind of like, are you sure that's a way out there? Actually, yes, I, I am sure. And um, so the, the backdrop I'd like to share with you is that the, the lens behind the eye is beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. Unfortunately, it matures to become a great liability for us all. And through that decay process, it threatens the integrity of all the structures inside the eye. In a sense, it's the bad apple. It leaves you prone to things like corneal dystrophies, which is kind of a clouding of the cornea, it leaves you prone to glaucoma, which can then rob you of quality of sight and quality of life. So the cells inside the eye are accustomed to having a privileged environment. The liquid inside there is actually far more, if you will, pure than blood plasma. And the, that environment then is almost like holy ground. It's an immunologically compromised, environment, and it's that way because the cells inside there are so delicate they can't even take those kinds of proteins. So there are kinds of assaults that we are exposed to uh, that accelerate as time goes on, and the first of them is a biochemical assault. The lens itself starts to decay and releases proteins and enzymes that actually cause those tissues to degrade. And then there's exposure to ultraviolet light, the photooxidation response, uh, which then causes degradation from the outside in. So we've got both from inside and outside kind of working to compromise that incredible uh, milieu that's inside the eye. So if we have laser surgery, then you compound that because that photooxidative reaction of that light hitting these cells uh, increases the uh, the stress on the cells that are just trying to do their job of keeping that beautiful cornea clear throughout your life. If those cells on the back of the cornea are compromised, then the, cloud, the cornea goes cloudy. If those cells are obliterated, the cornea goes white. So it'd be like everybody's kind of nightmare, right? So 
what I'd like to do now is show you the animation of the bionic lens. And at this moment in time, I'm going to be showing you a, an early prototype. And it's being installed inside the eye through the pupil through a tiny incision. It sits in the little envelope that holds the natural lens inside the eye and uses the same kind of kinetics to create curvature change. Now, the new and finalized bionic lens design is actually beautiful like the natural lens is beautiful. And it is composed of three components that uh, are insert insertable into the eye very simply through an injection apparatus by the surgeon. So he doesn't have to think, well, now I'm going to have to get this piano through that small door. You know, It actually is well, a little tiny you know, shot here. Oh, more coffee, please. Uh, next one. And the finale. OK, the final one. There we go. Done. So uh, those injections then uh, allow for the tiny incision in the eye to seal automatically, and the person's functional virtually immediately. Now, when all these three components are installed together, they actually are preconditioned to self-inflate. And they do so in a very controlled environment that we've created within the components of the bionic lens to uh, go into a high energy state and re-engage the, the muscles with inside the eye. So, the bionic lens being made of a single um, optical interface on the front responds to the muscle change with less than one one hundredth the amount of energy that the natural lens does. So, wow, what does that mean? Well, it means that you can focus and hold a book there all day and have virtually no strain on the eyes. Uh, additionally, it's a very efficient type lens. It's very thin. So it rolls up on almost nothing and in is injectable through a, a very small aperture. Uh, again, that kind of a, took us a long time to make all that happen. But um, how th this all works when it's put together is that um, the first component is kind of like a trampoline. And it's shown by those blue legs that you see on the screen there right now. And, um, this trampoline is the opposite of a normal trampoline, because normal trampolines, you jump on, boom, and up you go. The kinetic energy just springs right back. This trampoline is the opposite. You compress it, and it'll sit there all day before eventually it'll rise up to that higher energy state and just let it sit right there. So it's like memory foam. It allows the uh, internal components there to customize its shape, allow for the expansion of the optic to then enter into its optimized state so that the moment any reduction in, in pressure of these little strings that you see attaching the muscle to the lens capsule there, the moment that changes one little bit, the energy, kinetic energy, transfers through to the optic to cause it to change curvature immediately. So if we have one eye that's got a, its particular anomalies and then another eye that's got its different anomalies, and we self-adapt each of those eyes in the same manner, they will work in complete concerted continuity. They'll focus together as a team perfectly. So in a sense, the bionic lens is a composition or a compilation of control systems within the mid-peripheral regions of the lens inside the eye. And when we say mid-peripheral, we mean it's hid by the iris. You'll never see them. Right? So if we have mastery over the mid-peripheral region, we have mastery over the optics. Now, the, the second component, uh, I said the first one is the trampoline. The second one is this dynamic lens that uh, is conditioned to inflate at the right time. And the third component is a collar. It's an it's a opaque black collar that fits around the front. And that serves to reduce any stray light and glare. So a person will say, do I have glare at night? The answer is no, not at all. It's optimized for literally uh, uh, competition performance. And we've customized that collar with some rather unique properties in that it is a docking station for us to add ancillary technology if and whenever we want. We can insert it and we can remove it. Very, very simply through the very same tiny incision that's made by the femtosecond laser just off to the corner of the eye that self-seals.
Right? So it provides us access then to modify the quality of the visual experience that that person's going to have through their pupils. So what can we do with that? Well, there's four main areas. One is that we can provide customized optics that are sculpted using the technologies through wave front technologies that were designed by NASA engineers to make a lens that has far better focusing resolution than anything ever seen before. So that lens can then be inserted into the eye and the person looking through will say, my goodness, I thought I saw clearly before, now I know what my full potential is. And that full potential it, for, for, for some people is three times what 2020 is. For most people, it's about two and a half times. But that still feels pretty amazing, by the way. I happen to be one of those people. It's just naturally, I have had 2008 acuity my whole life. And there's a long reason why that is. But I'm 62 years old and my lens is not as clear as it used to be. And now I'm kind of struggling with the 2020 line. I hate it, right? <laughs> and when, when people, you have exceptional people, they'll say, oh yeah, I could see you know, things on the fly on the wall for hundreds of yards and my friends would doubt that it was there. We go there, there it is. That's the potential for us all. And so what we want to do is equal the playing field and make us all superstars in the eyesight competition. Right? And that we can do as long as the healthy, you know, the eye, the rest of the eye is healthy, the optic nerve works, and the macula isn't full of disease, and uh, those things are pre-requirements. It's not, the, the bionic lens isn't a magic bullet, it's just a darn good tool. Now, the other thing that we can do is we can use this docking station and the mid-peripheral regions that are hid behind the iris to hide certain things. And one of them is uh, for pharmaceuticals. We can actually have a s delivery, slow delivery system for medicines inside the eye. Um, the other is that we can actually put electronic systems there and we can generate ions, like a deionization chamber, if you will, to actually reverse the process of oxidation damage. So instead of having a natural lens that starts to contaminate and pollute the internal environment, we actually have an inert material that's equipped with the electronics to actually regenerate the inside structures of the eye. So, pretty cool trick. Um, the other part that we can do is that we can install projection systems. And that is a, a, a very exciting aspect in that we can uh, then have a projection system installed within the eye and upgrade it any time we want that is capable of projecting images out in aerial space. Right. So instead of me looking at my phone and saying, oh, yeah, I can't see the print very well, or maybe I can and I just don't have the desire to grab my pocket and fiddle with it, you can actually tell the, um, your mainframe computer, which will either be your watch or your headband, where the microchips will be stored, and you can say, well, you know, I'd like to see a uh, computer face, please. There it is generated from within inside the eye. And if you've got all the aspects, you know, all, all the, the apps and services that your iPhone provide for you today, in fact, you will be the phone, right, right inside you. So that is the, the thing that we, we have developed the bionic lens to, in its default mode, make our lives function better in their normal realm. In their augmented capacity, they allow for us to integrate seamlessly with the entire digital world. Now, as computer science develops and nanotechnology develops, the, the scope of which we can integrate along the visual pathway increases as well. My humble perception is, is that us human beings will be the center of artificial intelligence activity. So I believe that we are going to filter and chaperone artificial intelligence that will be either you know, around our head or on our watch or maybe both. So uh, it is, if you will, augmenting the human beyond what we normally anticipate. Now, if we were to ask, what's the downside of this technology? No, you know, kick the tires, where, where, where's the weak side? Well, uh, one, you'd hope that your surgeon is not inebriated when he's doing the job. Um, Second is that 
really the absence of this technology is the dark side because it, it really does create an unfair advantage for those early adapters versus those who don't. So I, I, I use the phrase instead of human augmentation, I use the phrase human enrichment. And that's really the final game for us. We want to make human beings have a more wholesome life, more creative, more productive, more engaged with your external, I mean, everywhere. You know, not just not like doing this, playing your games. I mean, the whole scope is now integrated seamlessly with the world. And that's what the bionic lens brings to the table. Thank you very much. <laughs>